Tonight, more expensive than ever as the price of gas ticks up across the country. That's insane. Yeah. How is this still happening? Drivers shelled out almost a buck seventy a liter in downtown Vancouver this weekend, and it could get worse. Albertans get ready to choose their future. I firmly believe we need to get that oil moving. I'm worried as to how we're going to get investors back. There's just one day of campaigning left before Alberta votes in one of the most contentious elections in the province's history. The National is in battleground Calgary. But here it is. The return to glory. And Tiger Woods roars to victory at Augusta, donning that green jacket for the first time in 14 years. Consider the comeback story complete. This is The National. If you drive, you know it's been getting more expensive lately. In the last five weeks, the average price in Canada for a litre of gas jumped by 14 cents. A big part of that came on April 1st when the federal government imposed a carbon tax in four provinces. That added about four and a half cents to each liter. But it is in Vancouver that prices have shattered a record for North American cities, reaching just shy of a buck 70 per liter. Now we want to know why it's climbed so much. So we asked Briar Stewart to look into it. And as you'll hear, there's a chance prices could go even higher. <laughs> It seems like every time you drive by and glance at one of the signs, those numbers just keep getting bigger. It's just continually going up. It's hard to know when to buy and, yeah, frustration. Metro Vancouver is setting records and it's frustrating for drivers. I think we're getting taxed, you know, out of existence. And taxes are a big reason why the price at the pump is now so high. They add more than 52 cents to the cost of every liter. That includes 17 cents for transit and 8.89 cents for the carbon tax. But those fees don't tell the whole story. BC imports its fuel, so part of the price surge boils down to supply. It is uh, dependent on external sources, including the United States, which is going through uh, neighboring Washington state, several planned refinery maintenance issues and of course a, an oversubscribed Trans Mountain pipeline. A gas price analyst says those U.S. refineries and the Trans Mountain pipeline bring in upwards of 70 percent of the fuel for the Vancouver market. BC's lower mainland is growing, so is the number of drivers, but the supply of gasoline isn't. And it could get worse. They were paying a buck seventy almost on gas in Vancouver this week. Uh, I'll tell you, that's just a, that's just an appetizer. On the campaign trail, Jason Kenney, the leader of Alberta's United Conservative Party, has warned of consequences if BC doesn't get on board with the Trans Mountain expansion. He's vowed that one of the first things he'll do if elected premier is to proclaim the so-called turn off the taps legislation. It was drafted under Rachel Notley's NDP government, but never proclaimed into law. We are prepared. If they will not respect the rule of law and allow us to export our products, there will be consequences. Now, Andrew, that legislation that Kenny is referring to, Bill 12, it would let the province limit the amount of oil and refined fuel that's shipped out of Alberta. And how is that threat going over where you are in B.C., Briar? Well, there's no doubt that that legislation is very contentious, and B.C.'s Attorney General David Eby has called it uh, unconstitutional, saying that energy transportation comes under federal jurisdiction, not provincial. And he has vowed that if that legislation is enacted and comes into effect, that the province will be launching a legal challenge. So, plenty to watch for. Okay, Briar Stewart in Vancouver tonight. So, Rosie, uh, needless to say, lots of folks in B.C. watching the Alberta election very closely, as are you. That's right, Andrew. The National will be in Alberta as the clock ticks down the provincial election. Polls open uh, in less than 48 hours now. And I am coming to you tonight from Calgary. Here, politics is being fought riding by riding, street by street, and candidates are really wrestling for control of the story before voters have the final say. If you want to continue to benefit from our hard work and our resources, you have to let us develop those resources Jason Kenney wants the focus to be on Alberta's economic pain, made worse, he says, by anti-Alberta forces outside the province, aided and abetted by Rachel Notley's NDP. The NDP in this province was always against our energy industry. We 
done everything to lay out the case to Albertans that we can. Notley has been trying to capitalize on a string of scandals for the United Conservative Party. There were incidents that occurred that, that, you know, we would not have talked about them if they weren't there. An effort to paint a Kenny government as unethical, intolerant or risky as per this full page ad in the Calgary Herald yesterday. Taken together, this campaign has been nasty, fueled by innuendo and outrage, but so far that isn't turning voters away. Advanced voting ended yesterday. It was easier than ever, and compared to 2015, the number of voters who cast their ballots nearly tripled. I can tell you that here right now, there's a sense of stakes for this election. The economic slump, the bitter debates around pipelines and even social issues, all that snapped people's attention to politics. But as Rafi Pujakanyan tells us, that means facing a lot of hype and half-truths pushed by parties and outside groups. Nobody becomes slandering on other parties coming from what they say is a credible source. These young voters say they're pretty savvy when it comes to separating fact from fiction on social media. But they can still be surprised by claims in this campaign. Why do we have a man, a man like Jason Kenney, telling us women what our health care needs are? Take this video advertising a website paid for by the NDP. Really? That's quite unfortunate because... Even if I don't like Jason Kenney, the way that they're portraying this, and how sensationalized and, like, I mean, look at the red and the black. It's not just political parties battling it out on social media. Third-party political action committees are also slagging political opponents, playing fast and loose with facts. Alberta placed limits on how much money these groups can spend in the election period, but none on how much they can raise. These groups have been at work elsewhere in Canada, Ontario Proud raising hundreds of thousands of dollars last year, supporting Doug Ford and attacking his rivals. We do know social media play a role in influencing how people uh, think about politics. We don't know to what extent it's actually going to influence how they're going to vote. CBC News reached out to several PACs involved in the Alberta campaign. Only one, Alberta Fights Back, agreed to an interview. It advocates for separation from Canada using posts like this one, linking to a CBC documentary about ISIS and falsely saying the broadcaster wants war criminals to return to Canada. I'm not the only one who holds that sentiment in Alberta or even in Canada. A lot of people are concerned and saying, like, why, why are the major broadcasters doing this? The very fast evolution of social media. The NDP insists it does not engage in fake news. We want to have a fact-based conversation in this election. We don't want this to turn into uh, Trump 2.0. But the party released a video it calls a documentary attacking the United Conservative Party's Jason Kenney for comments decades ago about his role as a student activist fighting gay rights. The video didn't mention he stated regretting those views years later. This is the course of the campaign from day to day. You can see it going through. This political scientist says citizens have to bring a critical eye to content they find online. The idea that we can force politicians, political strategists, volunteers to tell the truth during election campaigns not only flies in the face of you know, centuries worth of politicking throughout the world, but it's also not really putting the onus where it needs to be. Jason Kenney and the United Conservative Party say if they form government here, they'll create a war room dedicated in part to fighting what they call fake news about the energy industry. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Edmonton. Political messaging is one thing, but what are the people here actually looking for? We took our voters chair to Alberta to find out, and I'll be back with that later. We want to turn now to a developing story in the U.S. tonight. More than 100 million Americans are bracing themselves for severe storms all along the East Coast. Nearly 6,000 flights were canceled or delayed today on the heels of some vicious weather in the South. And at least 17 tornadoes tore through several states this weekend. Eight people were killed, many more injured. And as Paul Hunter tells us, the reality is setting in of just how much damage has been done. Check it out right here, man. It's right here. It's right, right here. here. The storm system is both fierce and massive, targeting a giant swath of the U.S. south and east. That's a tornado. That's yeah. it. Yep. That's it. 
multiple twisters, most of them overnight, leaving today a string of communities effectively flattened. This is the small city of Troy, Alabama, southeast of Birmingham. And consider these images shot by a weather channel in Mississippi. When it hit last night, say those who were there, it was unreal. So when the first tornado came through, I was in my room asleep. And I heard the shaking and the loud wind. It sounded like a train without the, without the whistle. I just got to my knees and prayed that, that everything would be okay. When it was pulling the washer and dryer and stuff, I didn't have nothing to try to grab because the walls was gone. And by that time, I was on the ground. And I everything once I hit the ground, everything started piling up on top of me. Throughout the region today was for assessing the damage and beginning the cleanup. But indeed, the storm was also a killer. Among its victims, two young brothers, three and eight years old, and a 95-year-old man, all killed by fallen trees. Inside this house, a woman was pinned by one. She survived. Tree landed in the living room, pushing furniture up against her, pinned her against the wall, and then she was there until we pulled her out. Now, as it all presses onward, with many millions further east awaiting the storm, its ferocity is clear. Over there is part of my garage. My front porch, the awning out over that house of the front porch, is in my neighbor's yard. Was she frightened as it all played out, huddling in the hallway with her grandkids? She said there wasn't even time for that. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Back in Canada, an Ontario First Nation is in a state of emergency tonight. They knew rising waters would once again force them to flee, but what they didn't know was that this year the danger would come so fast. 2,500 people live in Kasechewan on the shore of James Bay, and they are scrambling to empty out the place. What really stings, though, is what they see as a promise from the federal government that's been very slow to materialize. Olivia Stefanovic shows us what hangs in the balance. From the air, the danger facing Kasechewan is clear, a menacing wall of ice breaking up as far as the eye can see threatening the small Cree community each spring. It's really uh, frustrating for a lot of people. Chief Leo Friday says this year's heavy snowfall makes the possibility of flooding especially worrisome. Another concern, the reserve's dike is on the verge of breaking. An engineer's report calls the risk intolerable, forcing chief and council to declare a state of emergency yet again. More than 2,000 people are preparing to fly out this week. It will cost taxpayers roughly $20 million. I have no way of making sense of a nation as rich as Canada that would leave a community uh, like Kishetchewan in such a precarious situation year in, year out. In 2017, the community signed an agreement with the federal and provincial governments to find a permanent solution. But two years later, little progress. Our commitment to a long-term re relocation has not changed. That has not changed. What we're doing right now is we're working with the community on just the technical aspects of the move. Meanwhile, talks are ongoing. The permanent move will cost $500 million to $1 billion. Land has been identified 30 kilometers away, but it hasn't been secured yet. Until that happens, people like Brandon Gochi will continue to brace for the worst. I don't think it should be like that. Like, this is, oh, I'm hoping one day that uh, it's going to be like a, just a regular uh, annual breakup up river just to stay home and relax, not worry about evacuating. Indigenous Services Canada says it could take another eight to ten years to make the big move. The people of Kasechewan will continue to fly south every year, not knowing whether they will have homes to return to. Olivia Stepanovich, CBC News, Ottawa. The chief has publicly invited Justin Trudeau to visit their community, as well as Seamus O'Regan, the Minister of Indigenous Services. Chief Friday wants them to see for themselves the challenges on the ground. Okay, now a look at some developing stories we are watching tonight on The National, starting with a deadly shooting at a church in the B.C. interior. Two men were shot, one died at the scene, a church elder who was also a grandfather. His son calls it a targeted attack by someone known to the family. As for the other victim, that person was airlifted to hospital. 
and Mounties say they do have a suspect in custody. <laughs> Hundreds came out for a pair of Montreal area protests today against Quebec's secularism legislation. Bill 21 aims to ban public employees like teachers and police officers from wearing religious symbols on the job. Tomorrow, Montreal City Council will vote on a declaration opposing the bill. I am running for President of the United States. Yeah, that's Pete Buttigieg making it official. He's the latest Democrat throwing his hat into the ring for the 2020 presidential nomination. And you see there he's being cheered on by a hometown crowd in South Bend, Indiana. His husband joined him on stage. He's hoping to become the first openly gay president of the United States. Known as Mayor Pete, he's a 37-year-old war veteran, devout Christian, and Rhodes Scholar. Well, a Toronto woman is speaking out after she and her young family were sprayed with insecticide on a plane. Now, when airlines do that, they're just following regulations, but passengers rarely know it's coming. Here's Rosa Marcatelli with a Go Public investigation into pesticides on planes. That is pesticide being sprayed all over the cabin. Rania Kanizer couldn't believe it was happening on her flight just before it landed in Jamaica. Suddenly there was an announcement on the, uh, uh, the intercom saying that uh, they'll be walking down the aisle spraying a non-toxic insecticide. I thought, you know, insecticide doesn't sound non-toxic. There is no such thing as a non-toxic pesticide. That's Chris Van Netten, who studies the effects of pesticides on planes. He says passengers need to know ahead of time, especially the young, old, and those with respiratory issues. Like Kanizer's husband and her toddler, both are asthmatic. My asthma triggered probably within minutes. The World Health Organization okayed the pesticides for use in passenger cabins decades ago. Airlines have to do it before passengers board or during the flight. Dozens of countries require spraying to stop insects from spreading disease. What's not required is telling passengers before they fly. You're not given that choice. Transport Canada says it's out of its hands, but in an advisory, it admits the spray is a foreseeable hazard, saying passengers need to know so they can get advice from their own physician on whether they should travel to those destinations. It sets guidelines, not rules, saying airlines should notify passengers before they purchase their tickets on the flight ticket itself and before boarding the aircraft. People have a right to know what they are going to be exposed to. The airlines that fly to these places say the notification is on their websites. Air Canada also requires travelers who book directly on its website to click a box, agreeing to the airline's general conditions, which has a section on the spray. It also provides a link to the health information section in the itinerary. But these notices do not include flights booked on third-party travel websites, like the one Kanizer used. The union representing flight attendants has its own concerns. We get reports of, uh, uh, of, of sore throat, sore eyes, um, you know, uh, lots of uh, skin conditions. I'm concerned about potential long-term uh, neurological effects. All the airlines say they provide training and safety equipment to staff. There are non-spray methods being developed, like a mechanical air curtain that blows everything out, but they're still in the testing stages. So for now, travelers are left with few options. They can take precautions like wear a mask during the spraying or wipe down the surfaces, or just choose not to travel to the countries that require it. There's a full list on the Transport Canada website. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. Still to come on tonight's National, a very unusual result. Team Canada wins bronze at the Women's World Hockey Championship. We'll explain why that could actually be a big win for the game itself. And as Albertans get ready for Tuesday's election, some voters here have a message for Ottawa. They don't know we exist. The world ends in Winnipeg. They, they don't give a damn about to a Western Canada. Still ahead, what this election means to Albertans and a visit to one of the most conservative ridings in Canada. That's coming up. Back pass to Johnson, scores! A bittersweet day for Canada's women's hockey team. They did win medals at the World Championship in Finland today, just not the color they were going for. Canada pounded Russia to take the bronze after seven unanswered goals, which is nothing to sneeze at. But this is also the first time Canada didn't make the finals. 
the Americans did. Tappany tried that move in an overtime shootout. They beat Finland 2-1 to one for the gold. It was a long, grueling game, and again, a unique one, because in every single world championship to date, it's been Canada against the U.S. And that fact has even some Canadians wondering if there may be a silver lining to this year's result. Natalie Nanowski explains. Everybody always focuses on Canada-U.S., Canada-U.S., and they always just assume it's going to be Canada-U.S. in a final, but this time it wasn't the case. While professional hockey player Carly Campbell concedes that missing the World Championship final is a hard pill to swallow, being knocked out by Finland could actually inspire young girls around the world. Women's hockey is about hope and now they finally have hope that they can compete at the highest level in international hockey. And it's like that for other countries as well. So they're going to start investing in their young girls because good things are happening. Campbell played for the Toronto Furies in the CWHL, which before it collapsed was considered prime training ground. Countries sent their top players to learn from Canada's women and hone their skills, including Finland's goalie Nora Ratu, who showed off her talent today, blocking shot after shot against the U.S. It was inspiring watching the Finns play hockey, and you know you had to had to cheer for them. It. Uh, it did so much in their home country. I think that the other countries are really believing they can be there. Women's hockey does have support in other countries. Sweden has an elite league founded in 2008. It has 10 teams. Even tiny Luxembourg just launched a women's hockey team. And China has been building dozens of new rinks just to keep up with the sports demand. It's estimated that 200,000 women now play hockey around the world. And that number is growing. Despite the disappointment over Canada not winning silver or gold and the collapse of the CWHL, there's proof that women's hockey around the world has a bright future. Natalie Nanowski, CBC News, Toronto. And still ahead on the National, Tiger Woods did something today which many thought impossible. Just ahead, a comeback for the ages. But next, we'll head back to Rosie who is in Calgary tonight and we'll hear what's on the minds of Alberta voters. What's at stake for me in this election? What's at stake for me in this election? Uh, a job. Everything. As a non-binary queer person, a lot. These are critical battlegrounds in Alberta's election. Edmonton right now is an NDP stronghold, but its hold may be slipping. The United Conservative Party sees real opportunity here in Calgary. Half of Alberta's voters are found in these two cities. And two days from the election, there's a flurry of campaign activity here. Throw in the suburbs and smaller centres like Lethbridge and Banff and about four out of every five Albertans live in cities. For all the stereotypes about the province's cowboy character, rural Albertans actually struggle to have a voice. So Aaron Collins went to hear what some voters had to say beyond the city. Times pretty much stood still in Rowley, Alberta, a place where change is resisted more than embraced. Last really big change here was when the train stopped rolling through in the 90s. The final nail in a once bustling economy. This part of Alberta, is this maybe one of the most conservative spots in Canada, do you think? I would think it's pretty darn close to it. Well, just eight people call Rowley home these days. A place so small most locals have keys to the pub and are likely to lean a fair bit to the right politically. 80% of this riding voted for a Conservative candidate in the last provincial election. What does it mean to be Conservative? Aha, all we want to, is for people to leave us the hell alone, let us do our own thing out here. You think that's uh, the way most Canadians feel? I think it is. Uh, and it just, Conservatives do not want people button into their business. Well, public enemy number one these days, carbon taxes and the governments behind them. My personal opinion, I think it's a farce. Um, I don't think that anthropogenic climate change 
means anything other than a tax grab. But politics isn't fueled yeah. by beer around here. In a riding as big as Belgium, there's just too much driving for that. So in places like Veteran, population 207, it's coffee that stirs the pot of political debate. We know where we live in this part of the world, it's agriculture, oil and gas, small towns, communities. And we're in an area where ag and oil and gas work together. We are not Definitely. separate industries. The United Conservative Party candidate is the yeah. front runner here, and he has a simple pitch. Scrap the carbon tax, build more pipelines, and cut red tape. This is where we draw the line in the sand and we, we have a, a fight for a fair deal within Canada. It's what most people in this riding want to hear, drowning out the racist and homophobic ideas connected to some UCP candidates. I just want to be here and do my thing. I don't see skin color, I don't see sexual orientation, I don't care. I don't care about that stuff. An hour and a half south and east in Sedalia, another conservative contender is campaigning over coffee at the general store. Rick Strankman is the incumbent here, the latest in a long line of conservative MLAs. But Strankman believes conservative ideas work across Canada. Through these lenses and my lens, uh, yes, absolutely, for where I've traveled, uh, I, I see uh, many people who want to have less government involvement, less taxation, and uh, better effective use of, of those taxpayer dollars. So uh, I think everybody uh, just wants to uh, cohabitate, if you will, uh, without, uh, without frustration of government. At an all-candidates forum in nearby consort, signs of that frustration with Ottawa are easy to see and hear. They don't know we exist. The world ends in Winnipeg. They, they don't give a damn about to a Western Canada at all. It's a conservative crowd, to say the least. None of the candidates here support a carbon tax. All want more pipelines. If they don't get them, some are open to Alberta separation. The local NDP candidate is a no-show. It was all right of centre. There was no centre tonight. And, the cent and anything left of centre didn't show up because there would be no place for them, really. That says a lot, I think. Uh, absolutely. They, they knew they wouldn't have a friendly audience. Back in Rowley, change still comes pretty slowly, for the most part. Election in Alberta right around the corner, election in Canada pretty close. Is change coming? Hopefully. Uh, Alberta for sure, not so sure about Ottawa, but we'll keep our hope. A hope that political change in Edmonton and Ottawa will mean less government in these parts. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Rowley, Alberta. So every once in a while, the National puts out a chair and invites real people to just sit down and answer a tough question about an issue of the moment. Well, Nick Purden took our new voters chair to Alberta. You'll be seeing plenty of it in the lead up to the federal vote in October. And tonight's question, what's at stake for me in this election? <laughs> We'll read the question out loud. You ready? Okay, can I read it? Anytime. What's at stake for me in this election? What's at stake for me in the election? What's at stake for me in this election? What's at stake for me in this election? Uh, a job, everything. As a non-binary queer person, a lot. As a small business owner, I'm pretty interested in this election, so um, it's definitely gonna affect the outcome of my business, where it goes over the next five years and the decisions I have to make. My children, um, I'm wondering about their future in the oil catch, so that's at stake for me in this election. I firmly believe we need to get that oil moving, we need the pipelines done, and uh, that's my number one priority is, well, basically the economy. We need jobs and uh, we need to turn this ship around because we're going in the wrong direction. I want Alberta to be able to get back to work. However, I don't want it to be at the expense of things like education, supporting the arts, supporting nonprofits, supporting culture and uh, community. I'm worried. 
I'm worried as to how we're going to get investors back or how we're going to diversify. The oil and gas industries in Alberta are finished. If we have another government like the last one we've had for four years. My taxes have gone up. Um, our debt is out of control. And for my kids, they're going to be uh, struggling. And uh, that's not the future I want for them. I feel like we're falling behind, like I'm in kindergarten and not going to pass. I hope Alberta can remain at least as, as a prosperous as it, as, it, as it has been in the past. There's more division, hatred and bigotry in this election than I've seen in any provincial election in my life. It's making Alberta a more dangerous place for people to live. This is an important election for me on a scale of one to ten. I'd say it's about a 9.5. You know, I don't think it gets any more important than this. I think this election is something that everybody's looking forward to. <laughs> Good job. Good. We'll have more special coverage right here from Calgary tomorrow. My hope for the future of Alberta is that we really come together and we all work together as an inclusive society that everybody can feel safe and valued in. My hope for the future of Alberta is it is economically diverse, socially diverse and remains one of the best places to live in Canada. My hope for the future is that the next government of Alberta restores global investor confidence in the province and at the same time I want the government to respect the rights and look after the well-being of its most vulnerable citizens. We will talk to three voters who were undecided up until yesterday. We talked pipelines, the economy, and what they're hoping Alberta looks like come Wednesday morning. That's tomorrow night on The National. And coming up next on The National, a surrogate story. Why prospective parents are looking very keenly to Canada. I, I love being a mom, and why wouldn't I want to help somebody else do that too? So, yay! Oh, no. <laughs> but first, a return to greatness for a gifted athlete who changed his sport forever. Tiger Woods is a champion once again. But here it is. And with that, from a two-shot deficit, Tiger roared back to victory at Augusta National, a Masters champion for the first time in 14 years. It's been a long road. As one of the most naturally gifted golfers in history, Tiger Woods was for years a rock star, a solid gold investment to his sponsors, and a living symbol to people of color that any barrier can be broken, until it all came crashing down a decade ago. His image was shattered by a sex scandal. His sponsors dumped him, and serious back problems almost killed his career. But he battled back, slowly, surely, Oof. and today, a return to glory. Yeah, buddy. Congratulations, Tiger. Good for him, and maybe even better for the game. Golf uh, has seen a bit of a decline, and you can uh, contribute it to maybe the decline in Tiger. Now that he's back, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people in the industry that are hoping that it will um, have a rebound effect and that it will bring a renewed uh, interest and enthusiasm to the sport. Woods, who lost his beloved father Earl back in 2006, savored today's win with his children and his mother. Just to have them there and then now to have them see their, their pops win. Um, just like my pop saw me win here, it, uh, it's pretty special. Today marks Woods' fifth Masters win and his 15th major, did. leaving him just three back from his idol, the retired legend, Jack Nicklaus. This is CBC News. What makes it news to you? One small step for man. Is it something that tugs at your heart? The Constitution is now home. Or opens your eyes. The Berlin Wall is coming down. If the story matters to you, 
your community, fires burning across the province, or the entire world. We're going to build the wall. You can always turn to us. CBC News, right where you are. Hi there. Some stories we'll be watching this week on The National. Yes, pot is legal now, but an annual cannabis protest in Vancouver is still on for Saturday. Organizers say laws are still too restrictive. But critics say that 420 gathering stopped being a protest a long time ago, and organizers should pay for things like policing, something protesters don't typically have to do. Speaking of rallies, beginning tomorrow and for as many as three days, climate change protesters in Europe are planning to block the streets of central London. They're calling on government to reduce carbon emissions to zero by 2025. And the royal countdown is underway. Harry and Meghan's baby is due any day now, but there's quite the bubble of privacy around them. Don't expect much in the ways of public appearances when it happens. And it may even be a few days after the birth if there's any news, possibly coming on the couple's new Instagram account. Now here's another British baby whose birth attracted global attention. 41 years ago, Louise Brown became the first living person conceived outside of a woman's body. Since then, millions of families have used in vitro fertilization as a way of realizing their dream to have children. The technology has come a long way and so have the rules around how it's done. Tonight, we want to tell you the story of a gay British couple whose quest for children brought them to Ontario. They found an ideal surrogate mother, and as you'll hear, also a legal framework that suited their situation. Kayla Hounsell has our dispatch from Red Hill, England. At the Bernie Edwards household, things can get a bit chaotic. With two kids under two. Bye bye. Someone is always on the move, and with that comes the cheers ah! and the tears. But Graham and Simon Bernie Edwards wouldn't have it any other way. Oh, bye bye. You see, there was a time when they thought they could never have any of this. You just sort of step back and go, wow. It can be very surreal. This is, this is, this is it. They're here. Hi, uh, Daddy. <laughs> As gay men, they thought they'd never be biological fathers. Then an IVF clinic in Vegas told them they could have twins and each be a father of one child. I mean, what did you think when you were told that the first time? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very busy, Calder. Huh? So while Alexandra and Calder may seem like typical toddlers, they're anything but. They're twins, but only half siblings. Born just minutes apart, they have the same biological mother, but different fathers. So they harvested uh, the um, eggs from the egg donor. They fertilized half of those eggs with my sperm, half with Graham's sperm. The embryos were implanted in the same surrogate at the same time. The Bernie Edwards say they chose to have their children in Canada because they were drawn to the legal framework. <laughs> they say English law is dated, primarily because it considers the surrogate, and if she has one, her husband, to be the legal parents for the first six weeks of the child's life. In that time, if the surrogate decides to change their mind, you have no, no recourse, basically. That's it. Your child is gone, and... That is it. So in the UK, our laws are somewhat archaic. I would this fertility and surrogacy lawyer says Canada is a favourite for Brits seeking surrogacy. I think it gives an element of certainty. Um, it gives the transparency, which we can't offer always, and it gives a very clear structure. Uh, Spearman says while UK surrogates and intended parents do draw up contracts outlining their agreement, the contracts aren't legally binding. Neither country allows for payment to surrogates other than to cover expenses. It's another reason the Bernie Edwards chose Canada and Meg Stone. Oh, Mom, you should have done that. One, two, three. Stone and her children live in Hamilton, Ontario. 
She says she was also drawn to the Bernie Edwards profile. They mentioned that they wanted twins, and I'm always up for a challenge. And they also said they wanted lifelong friendship, which was also something I wanted. After an agonizing wait, they found out it had worked. Stone was pregnant with twins. Yeah, I think we, we sat there for a, probably a couple of hours, sort of going through elation to crying to thinking, what are we done? <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty much a yay! Mm. Oh, no. <laughs> After a couple of false alarms that saw the dads dashing off to Canada early, Alexandra and Calder arrived in Canada. Meg continues to watch the twins, now 21 months old, grow from afar, swapping messages and photos. Happy birthday! Even making the trip to the UK for the twins' first birthday. birthday to you. Hey guys! Wow! <laughs> Don't you look well? Stone doesn't seem to think what she did is very extraordinary. Even though she's doing it again for another couple, currently pregnant with twins. I, I love being a mom and why wouldn't I want to help somebody else do that too, so. She maintains she wouldn't want to be paid for helping others have children, but there is a debate in Canada about whether paying surrogates should be decriminalized. Simon and Graham say when it comes to surrogacy law, Canada has it right. But that doesn't mean it was easy or cheap. They still spent tens of thousands of dollars on Stone's expenses, agency and legal fees, not to mention the travel back and forth. Every single penny, penny cent was worth it. Yeah. I love Ontario because there are lots of interesting things to see. Although none of their biological parents are Canadian, Alexandra and Calder are Canadian citizens. Their parents say it's an important part of their heritage. They can't have a relationship with the, their biological mother, the, the egg donor, it's a, an anonymous donor. And so that's why it's really important to us that they do know where they've come from. What's this one? Goodbye. Explaining it all to the children has already begun. Sleep. I'll blow a kiss goodnight to make sure all of Canada will have sweet dreams tonight. Kayla Hounsell, CBC News, Red Hill, England. So Canada is reviewing the law that governs assisted reproduction. As you heard in the story right now, it is illegal to pay someone to carry a child for you. But also, as you heard, you can reimburse them for pregnancy-related expenses. The government is working to clarify which expenses are allowed. The call for public input closed in January. Okay, we do have another round of golf coming up on the National. The Masters didn't just produce a huge win for Tiger Woods. It also produced our moment. And then up steps Justin Thomas. Eight iron. program we brought you the story of Tiger Woods's redemption at the Masters but that wasn't the only historic thing to happen on that course in Georgia today another big piece of the action happened on the 16th hole and that is our moment and then up steps Justin Thomas this is American Justin Thomas teeing up And he nails what every golfer lives for and dreams of. Now, on Augusta, every hole-in-one is a history-making moment. And Justin Thomas's name officially goes into Masters history, becoming the 22nd player to ace this particular hole. But get this, he wasn't the only one today. DeChambeau said, let me see if I can do one better. Seven iron. This is the 21st hole-in-one at the 16th. Come on.
Just three hours earlier, another American, Bryson DeChambeau, shot an ace of his own, the first one of his professional career, which he looks pretty happy about. <laughs> and while we're talking numbers, if you happen to be the sort of person who wagers on these sorts of things, the odds against two players getting a hole in one in the same event, around 32,000 to one. <laughs> now, I'll be the first to admit, I don't play golf, so I feel like I'll never uh, really appreciate just how hard it is to nail a hole in one, except to know that it is, of course, uh, improbable, bordering on impossible, under the best of conditions. Never mind trying to do that with all of those people watching. And at the Masters! Uh, you got to be kidding me. That's something. It doesn't happen every day. That's the National for this Sunday, April 14th. Have a good night.